so oh. people are already saying their names. <laughs> I think we'll have to begin because we've started the recording now. So today's chapter is on loving kindness and compassion. So it is a very lovely subject and one that we can all plunge into as far as we wish. You can never have too much loving kindness or compassion. If you think you have too much and people are taking advantage of you, that's because you have too much for others and not enough for yourself. Or maybe not too much for others, but just not enough for yourself. So it's always this um, loving kindness and compassion that is to all as to oneself. And I think because of that phrase, probably in the suttas, which is found in the early Buddhist suttas, um, the Visuddhi Magga and the practices that sort of um, are very popular in Myanmar and countries influenced by the Visuddhi Magga, I think probably in Sri Lanka too, tend to start with oneself. So is it really hard to hear? Because I'm seeing some people look like they're straining. No? Okay. All right. I'll carry on. So there's three or maybe more. Yeah. Okay. Six excerpts of suttas on loving kindness. So we'll see if we can get through it, but I'm sure that in the next two sutta classes, we can, we can do that. As I say, I'm quite tired today because there's been a lot of excitement in my world and a lot of talking and discussing and figuring things out. So if you do wish to raise your hands at any time, at least when I'm pausing, please do. It'd be great to make this more of a discussion um, session today. So I shall start by reading out the first passage, and this is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 99, and I didn't check the name of that sutta, uh, but you can check it out later if you wish to read the whole thing. So this is called The Four Divine Abodes. The Buddha told the young Brahmin Subha, here a monk or a nun <laughs> dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with loving kindness. Likewise the second, likewise the third, likewise the fourth. So above, below, around and everywhere, and in every way, one dwells pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with loving kindness, abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. And it's quite hard for me to read that without getting a tune in my mind because this is chanted quite a lot, slightly different words, but it's chanted quite a lot in the Thai forest monasteries. Um, and it's quite a nice chant to do. You can do it in the English or in the Pali. The Pali is a bit more like a kind of mantra in a sense. And the English is a little bit, um, it's quite melodic. It's quite nice. We should do it sometime when we're all together. Maybe we can chant these sort of so, and also when we practice sometimes together on a, a Saturday, we could try it tomorrow. Sometimes we do that. We spread our loving kindness in all directions. So it's talking about the four quarters. So it doesn't mean you have to like channel your meta energy just exactly in one quarter than exactly in another. It's just saying there's no part untouched. It's just immeasurable. It's abundant. It's in every direction. And again, in some traditions, they do also send meta above and below. Uh, and even in the medium direction, so like southwest, southeast, northwest, northeast, just to make sure that our meta is basically spreading. So we can imagine that happening, or we can actually, uh, yeah, if you're more visual, you can imagine it. I personally kind of tend to feel it in my body, like I feel I connect with any pleasant sensations or thoughts of peace that may be embodied. Uh, physically and I imagine those kind of vibrations going outward. Sometimes you can actually put your awareness when you meditate slightly outside the body and it's amazing you can become quite sensitive even to the atmosphere around you. I find that quite interesting. I think it's what you know people read auras don't they? Many people sort of read auras and you know many people talk about a certain aura around a person with a lot of love and kindness that you come into their kind of orbit and suddenly feel better, suddenly feel calm. So this is really very beautiful, I would say. So then it carries on. When the liberation of mind by love and kindness is developed in this way, no limiting karma remains there, none persists there. 
just as a vigorous trumpeter could make themselves heard without difficulty in the four quarters. So too, when the liberation of mind by loving kindness is developed in this way, no limiting comer remains there, none persists there. This is the company, the path to the company of Brahma. And then he goes through the same uh, sequence, the same formula with all the other um, Brahma Viharas. So next he says, one dwells pervading one quarter with a mind imbued with compassion and then imbued with altruistic joy, mudita. With a mind imbued with equanimity, upeka, equipoise, balance, serenity. Likewise, the second, the third, the fourth, so above, below, around and everywhere and in every way. He dwells pervading the all-encompassing world with a mind imbued with equanimity. That's the last one we're talking about. Abundant, exalted, immeasurable, without hostility and without ill will. When the liberation of mind by equanimity is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there, none persists there. Just as a vigorous trumpeter could make themselves heard without difficulty in the four quarters, so too when the liberation of mind by equanimity is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there, none persists there. So it's very nice. So any comments already? I can see Rob has his hand up. I'm mute, Rob. Hi, um, yeah. Hi. Um, can you hear me? Okay. I think that's a yes. You've gone quiet again. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, good. Um, so this section, when it talks about equanimity in the same way as all the other Brahma Viharas. Um, I don't often hear about equanimity being taught as an emotion, but I do hear it being taught with regards to compassion and loving kindness and um, altruistic joy. They're taught almost as emotions, but equanimity is kind of I think it's difficult to teach that as an emotion. It's not really been talked about much in that way. What do you think about that? I think that's quite a deep question. And I think equanimity is um, a very exalted state of mind, if, especially as a Brahma Vihara. Um, there's different kinds of equanimity depending on the kind of practice you're doing. So the kind of equanimity I used to practice was more towards the arising and passing of Vedana, pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral um, feelings. And they could be physical or mental. And there was a sense of um, equipoise and balance. And I, I think equanimity was a good word for the way that the mind would remain very, very steady with all of that um, and quite non-reactive with all of that. But the kind of equanimity that the Buddha is talking about here is as one of the immeasurables. And it says here, when the liberation of mind by these four Brahma Viharas is developed. So whenever it says liberation of mind, it usually refers to the jhana states. So we can assume these are samadhi states. And I would say from my brief experience with practicing um, equanimity in that way, um, some experience, let's say, because I can't say necessarily how deep that was, but um, it, it is a kind of emotion. I would say it's an emotion of peace. And I've heard Ajahn Brahm say before that um, peace is an emotion. It's not a nothing. It's not a kind of deadness or a deadening. It's actually something quite refined. So we might not notice it straight away. And I think this kind of equanimity in the Brahma Viharas is extremely refined, um, but it does have a quality of peace. It's not a nothing. And it's also, of course, tied in with the absence of hostility and ill will, right? So it does have an ethical aspect to it because it arises, all these Brahma Viharas arise and get deeply established when there's an absence of hostility and ill will. So that suggests that they are on the side of something sublime, something um, beautiful, rather than just being a blank kind of indifferent state of mind. 
So I think it's subtle, but I would say it's a, a kind of emotion, but it's not an emotion that's um, that's vacillating. It's a steadiness. It's a serenity, a kind of evenness of mind. Um, it doesn't feel charged as some emotions may. But then I think even with compassion and loving kindness and sympathetic joy, bit by bit, they start to settle. You know, at first it might be a little bit exciting to get a lot of PT, for example, in the mind. But when it reaches the stage of like deep, uh, practice, you know, metta as a Brahma Vihara, metta as a jhana, as a jhana, as one of the jhanas, um, then it would be extremely steady, extremely calm, but just imbued with that warmth of metta that's quite unmistakable. I hope that helps a little bit, but I think these things have to be tasted and experienced time and time again. Yeah, great question. We'll ask Maxwell to unmute. Um, yeah, as I wondered if you might be able to help a little bit to do with that. Um, but when I meditate, uh, and my mind say is misbehaving or going all over the place and I tell it off, <laughs> who, who is telling it off? Yeah. Just or your conditioning. Telling... <laughs> Sorry? It's just your conditioning. Right. It's just the way you've been programmed, you know, okay. um, like the way you say, say that your mind's misbehaving. Well, who said that's misbehavior? It's because that's what you've learned is right. um, is not, you know, well behaved. <laughs> Maybe it's led to trouble in life, you know, when you have those kind of thoughts or mental behaviors. Or maybe it's just that you've internalized that you know, from something you're not supposed to do externally, you've internalized that to criticizing yourself internally. Um, so I think the mind, I mean, you can see it, if you want to see it as misbehavior, you can see the mind as this little child that just sometimes wants to rebel and wants to have a bit of, you know, time when it can do what it wants, because we're so, the mind's so fed up with us pushing it around. We're always pushing it around. Like all day today, I was pushing my mind to keep on fiddling with my newsletter, get this link in, format this picture, change that sentence, you know, have I got the right link in the right place? And it's like pushing your mind a bit because you're tired, actually. And so I think sometimes when we meditate, the mind just wants to say, oh, give me a break. And it just wants to do its thing. And one of the best ways to deal with that, I feel, is just to be kind to the mind and allow it to do that and say, OK, mind, you know, if you want to go playing for a while, it's fine. I'm not going to believe in you. You know, I'm not going to listen to you if you tell me to get off and go and make a cup of tea. But I'm just going to sit here and allow you to do what you need. And I'm here for you when you come back. You know, <laughs> I'm waiting for you when you come back. <laughs> are you are you still asking something? I can't tell. That's, that's fine. Thank you. No, that's very helpful. In other words, loving kindness to your mind. Loving kindness to your mind. And that's not coming from anyone either. That's just coming from conditioning that you've heard from Dhamma teachers or right. from the suttas. Right. So none of it's coming from anyone. It's just like we're on a certain program. And unfortunately, yeah. some of us have had fairly negative programs and it's like got stuck in the kind of, I don't know, I'm not good with computers, so I can't say I know it, but maybe it's in the kind of what do you call it? The back end of the computer or something. Yes, yes. Um, and bit by bit, we have to sort of gently change that program. So every time that you go on a different program, a more positive and more um, beneficial program, try to really notice it and say to your mind, you see mind, you know, this is great. You know, you've done really well there. You see, it was much happier when you were more gentle and you, when I was more kind with you, you, you sort yeah. of acknowledge that rather than just focusing on the times it so-called misbehaves yeah, thank you <laughs> <laughs> poor mind <laughs> i think nikki has a hand up real hand mute yeah. yeah. Ha. Lovely. Hiya. I wanted to ask you about this. I often wonder about this. And that when you were talking, um, I think with Rob about equanimity, would that look? And I kind of understand it intellectually, but how would that look on a practical day to day? Um, so does it look 
a little bit like, I feel a little bit like tough love. Um, in a sense of, if I think about, I'm thinking about my children, that, that having to put a boundary up that feels really uncomfortable, um, but have that steady, what you were talking about, that steady state of, uh, it's, the, it's the right thing to do. Is that right? Am I making sense here? Yeah, totally. It's an interesting angle because I wouldn't have thought of it in that way. But in a sense, it could be seen that way um, because in order to do that, like you say, it's quite unpleasant. But you have to stay steady with your reasoning behind it and, you know, kind of trusting yourself and just sometimes weather the, um, the kind of, what do you call it, the comeback that you might get, you know. Um, so that would involve probably some equanimity. Um, whenever things outside are difficult and people are irritating us or triggering us in some way, it's usually because the equanimity is not very strong. So if we can develop a sense of um, equanimity that understands in a sense that we're all just playing out, living out our karma, and we can try and help other people, we can try and do the right thing, but ultimately we can't really make it better for other people. Um, that's another way to kind of understand equanimity, that we do our best, but we may be wrong, it might not work. Um, so we come from a place of loving kindness, compassion and everything else, and then accept that, you know, it may not always please others, really. Um, so yeah, it's kind of being able to step back, I think a little bit and not get too involved, not get too pulled around by the kind of ups and downs in life, the four worldly winds, praise, blame, uh, fame, disrepute, pleasure and pain, and all these other things. Yeah, it's, uh, what are the other two, actually? I might as well finish the eight. Pleasure, pain, fame and disrepute, gain and loss, gain and loss. Yeah. So it's the kind of equanimity, it's, it's, I like the simile of climbing up a hill and seeing from above, getting a perspective on things. Um, seeing where you can help, where you can intervene and where you just have to say, okay, I've done my best. Now I have to just let go a little bit. Yeah. For me, equanimity, the way it manifested in life, I guess, through my practice, especially in, in um, India, when I was very much connected with every single sensation in my body, sort of things that I wouldn't even really be in contact with now because that's not my main focus. Um, it was really interesting because before you actually get angry or react in a negative way or say something negative, you would feel a kind of <laughs> sensation, you know, of kind of maybe contraction or a bit of fear or a bit of energy coming up in the body. And you'd feel it coming and just stay cool with it. Okay, realizing it's coming and it's going all the time, it's arising and passing. And because you could see that it was arising and passing, there was almost no place for to get stuck on that it was changing so quickly there was no meaning in reacting and the reaction would just dissipate it sometimes wouldn't even come up at all so that's also a kind of equanimity being able to hold it all and stay steady yeah hmm I was wondering to ask people actually about these words, if anybody has any comments, because there's these uh, three words that sound like similes in a way, but I think they are a little bit different. Abundant, exalted and immeasurable. Really beautiful words, aren't they? Abundant. I'm not sure what the Pali is. It might be Paripunnam or something. Exalted could be Mahagata, but I'm not sure. But immeasurable is Apamana. And that's a really interesting um, word because Apamana, immeasurable to me, also means not measuring ourselves, like not measuring others, not kind of, you know, writing up a list of positives and negatives the way we did yesterday when we went to see a house. <laughs> we had to write a list of all the, you know, out of 10 on various things. It was really scoring, keeping score and measuring. And of course, that's not really meta because we didn't love that house enough to actually buy it for the monastery. <laughs> that's just a joke. But yes, 
so what do you think? Abundant, exultant, immeasurable. Has anyone got comments on that? What that means to, to you? You don't have to give like a thesis or an academic answer. <laughs> it's just an explanation. Aha, can we go to Amina? Wow, four of you, awesome. So, uh, thank you so much. I think um, it's always struck me how, yes, it oscillates between all those beautiful things, but um, more often not very intimidating. I mean, it's quite a tall order, <laughs> which is yeah. also why it's so beautiful as well, but um, quite intimidating. That's very true. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I guess Again, this is talking about meta when it's been developed to an extremely high level and it's more perhaps a description of what the flavour of real love and kindness is rather than something that we can necessarily experience in full. Um, but I think they're qualities that we can start to work with. Maybe the abundant and exalted is a little bit, uh, abundant is quite a big word, right? But exalted, I mean, every time, say you have a negative thought or an uncharitable thought about someone and you just can change that a little bit into something much softer, then you've elevated your mind. Is that similar to exalted, right? Elevating. You've sort of lifted yourself out of the, you know, dong for a moment. And, and there can be a very, it might not seem like much, but there can be a subtle uh, shift and you find that the mind is slightly happier, slightly less tense and prickly. I like that word you sometimes use. <laughs> slightly less um, brittle as well. I like to use the word brittle because I find meta softens the mind. Um, like when I'm tired or when I'm sort of feeling like overwhelmed by the amount of work I have, I'm more brittle. So if somebody says something, even if it's a normal thing, I just can't take anything else in because my mind's kind of, ah, <laughs> kind of very, Whereas the meta just like, mm, just slightly, slightly relaxes and widens the mind. I think that's also can be part of this exalted abundant, you know, it's bigger, it becomes bigger again. There's a little bit more space for the next sentence and the next sentence. <laughs> or sometimes just to say, I'm sorry, I need to rest now, you know? <laughs> yeah, but that's an important point. And I think all of these are sort of more um, descriptions so that we can at least, um, sort of get a flavor of what meta is about and know that, for example, if it is immeasurable, that's the opposite of measuring. I find that nice because that brings it back to a sort of very daily life thing. And we can see that, can't we, when we start kind of judging someone, we're starting to measure or judging ourselves. Oh, my meditation today is not as good as it was. I sometimes think my meditation now is not as good as it was when I was in Burma, for example. And that's a stupid measurement because there wasn't one type of meditation then and one type now. I mean, it's just totally different. So anyway, I don't know. There's a few thoughts. <laughs> Thanks though. Yeah. I will ask Veronica to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I mean, something terribly simple. Those, whenever I've read those words, I, it just gives me a sense of vastness. This, I sub, can substitute the word vast for a gentle vastness, not in the intimidatory one. Just awesome, I suppose, as well. of ties into this whole description the vastness you know that there's no limiting comma there's nothing remaining there it's sort of so big that it can really contain everything yeah it's very nice I mean I personally find just reading these words kind of uplifts the heart even if it's not something I experience all the time it's um you know I can get tastes of it um but yeah, it's just something wonderful. I think of it also as widening the circle of what we're able to accept or who we're able to accept. Um, yeah. 
experiences that we're able to accept. Yeah, vastness. And the other one you said was awesome. No, or, or inspiring. Awesome. Sorry, you're muted again. Awesome. I yeah. said awesome. Yes, all in, uh, yes, spaciousness, all embracing, but not intimidatory. Just, uh, yeah. you know, because sometimes you say vast or awesome, I suppose that can almost be, seem overwhelming, but I think there's a loving kindness about it all. It's just huge with the other three, with the joy and the three that have gone before. Yeah, yeah. It was interesting when you said about it um, not being intimidating because you could also interpret that as um, when the mind is big and when the loving kindness is vast, it's not um, smothering, you know, it's not sort of um, intimidating in that way that you're sort of feeling like it's sticky and that you're being smothered by somebody, it's actually very wide and open and it's like, you yeah. can come and you can go, you know, it accepts people, but it also lets people go. Yeah, I you mean, I, I've heard somewhere a story about, it might be from the suttas, it, it was uh, way back in my practice about somebody being in a room with a whole lot of guests and them coming past and you just can acknowledge and let them go. You don't need to get stuck in their conversation or their angst or whatever it is. Acknowledge and they go. Acknowledge and they go. And like that with thoughts as well. It, gives, it summons that old story up for me as well. John Graham always says he can um, take a lot of sort of stuff from people you know because obviously in a monastic role even in my role you you get a lot <laughs> but most of us kind of keep it so we get overwhelmed you know and he says he's like a dustbin with no bottom <laughs> so it comes in but it also goes out yeah and the good. same thing for difficult people you can let them in but you can also let them go yeah right? as in don't let whatever difficult conversation or difficult person kind of keep on reverberating in your mind yeah yeah that, you know, there's a door into the room and there's a door out and they just go through, yeah. Uh, shall we go to Paul, who's had his real hand up? Uh, thank you very much for that. Uh, Excellent. Exactly in the process of... Um, typing out my uh, query. Uh, now, um, upeka or equanimity, uh, the thought uh, crossed my mind during this um, session, uh, whether equanimity or upeka uh, can also involve being equanimous on behalf of others. You know, equanimity um, on behalf of ourselves, you know, um, seeing, say, the eight worldly winds um, of being sort of detached from pain or pleasure, etc., etc. But we tend to get, or I find myself, being attached to the good fortune of others, say, one's children, spouse, close friends. And, you know, if you see, you resist the idea of them becoming poor or losing their job or becoming ill. So does this idea of equanimity perhaps also involve a certain sort of um, um, meta towards them, concern which is free of the eight worldly winds? You just have this meta towards them just as they are, irrespective of... Um, Absolutely. I don't know how well I'm putting this. I don't know if the gist of it is. Absolutely. Totally articulate. Uh, yeah, it's actually a great point because I think all of these Brahma Viharas are to ourselves and to others and they have to be relational. Um, but you're reminding me of a little booklet I have about the four Brahma Viharas and in there, the simile is that uh, they're all similes around how we relate to others and 
um, it says that metta is like the love that a mother or a father has towards a child who is young and, you know, just a little child. And you have all this kind of love and warmth towards them. And then compassion, karuna, is like the love, the love of a parent when their child is sick. It just has a different quality. It's the same care, but it's tuned into their sickness. It has this wish to relieve them of pain. And then the mudita is like the emotion that one feels when the children start to grow up and they may be um, becoming successful. They're doing well at school and or at college. And maybe they're, you know, you're seeing them kind of flourish. You're seeing them grow. So you have this feeling of mudita, like you're happy for them, right? You're also happy for yourself that you've brought them up quite well. And then uh, the equanimity is like into when the parent, when the child leaves, you know, they leave from university, they go out into the world. Um, you set them up as well as you can for life, but they're going to come across all kinds of situations that you won't be able to protect them from. And it's the kind of equanimity that lets them go and understands that yes, you'll always be there for them, but you can't protect them from the lessons that life has. And that the things, the struggles, the difficulties, as well as the joys that they'll come across in their journey. So that's a kind of equanimity. And I think that's quite hard, isn't it, for parents, you know, with grown up um, teenagers or early 20 year olds uh, to see them just going, you know, and leaving home. And there has to be a kind of equanimity there because, yeah, you can't expect them to call you every night or know exactly where they're at. My mom had a bit of a shock when I just left, you know, at 18. Firstly, I went to Israel and I did trips to Egypt and things like that. And, you know, some dodgy situations trying to walk across Cairo in, I don't know, five in the morning. And there was all these kind of, um, what do you call those dogs, like street dogs, really dangerous, barking like anything. I was terrified. And you had to do that to get to this local bus to take you back to Israel. <laughs> and my mother, if she knew a lot of my adventures, that was just rather moderate. But, uh, oh, I don't know if she could have been equanimous at all, but I think she must have developed quite a lot of equanimity by just realizing I have to let her go. I have to let her go into the world and just trust and hope that everything will be fine. And if I'm here, if she needs me, I'm here. You know, If she wants to come back, I'll... And she did always help me come back. My parents would buy me a ticket home. But when I went, they would, I would be on my own. I wouldn't get any sort of financial or support from them. I often couldn't get to a phone. So, yeah, I don't know if that really answers the question, but I guess that's something that I uh, relate to in that way, at least. Okay. Shall we go to Darren? Okay, sure. Was, I think Diana may be first. I'm not sure if Diana wants to go first. Or will I go now? Okay. Um, <laughs> you go, Darren. I'll go next. Okay, thanks, Diana. Um, it's just really amazing just reflecting on that uh, abundant, exalted and immeasurable. And um, for me, it, it took me back to um, Ajahn Brahmali and the death contemplation meditation. And when I first went through that, um, I could never imagine myself doing that. But it was the, the boundless, unconditional, um, love and kindness um, of just giving without any expectation of anything in return. It's just have the shirt off my back, have the last grain of rice. Um, and it is just having that joy and that freedom um, of just seeing the other person um, benefit from that. And when <clears throat> when Ajahn Brahmali was when he was um, taking, th taking us through the meditation, um, and it was all about if I had three hours or five minutes left to live, how would I be treating people? And those three words really encapsulate that. But in the meditation, I sort of flipped it around as well. And when I'm talking to people, and I don't do this all the time, well, not many times, but I try to, that if I imagine that they've got three hours left to live, they've got five minutes left to live, how am I going to be with them? And there would be no... Um, caveats. There may be there be no clauses or anything at all. It would just be complete unconditional um, love, ec um, equanimity, whatever it is. It's just I don't want anything in return. I just want you to be happy, um, and it's with without wanting, or not even without wanting, but without 
um, thinking about wanting something in return of that thought process. Just it's just um, an infinite um, lifetime away um, of any expectations of anything in return. Um, and I think it then sort of combining that with what you then explained about walking up the hills and, and I just then pictured myself that I'm in this forest in this valley and it's all dark and I'm in, a, I'm in this bog and then I then get through this to the top of the mountain and then I look down at the amazing forest and I look down at the view and I'm looking, looking around at the vista and it's just it, it's all these things combined I'm probably waffling a little bit now but it was it's more I think what Ajahn Vermali was saying and, and that limitless and boundless and unconditional um not not thinking about wanting anything in return um, thank you that really highlights and i love that reflection i'm going to try that myself i have only done the death reflection thinking that i may have just a few hours left but that's very powerful to recognize that it may be the case for others and it is the case for others you know that they may only have three hours left and one day they will only have three hours left and uh, it just reminds me of something Ajahn Chah once said about the glass with the crack in it you know that we don't see the crack but it's there and if it was made of plastic or something it wouldn't break but because it's made of glass we have to care and I think that's very tied into what you were just saying it's such a beautiful reflection it's incredible how I guess the death meditation and the climbing to the top of the hill are similar in that they both give a lot of perspective they give an immediate perspective on all our little kind of niggles and <laughs> complaints you know and from the top of that hill you look down and you see the gorse bushes you see the kind of thistles you see the beautiful trees the rivers the lakes and you can be grateful for the whole lot because that's what got you to the top of that hill you came through all of that and you learnt along the way you can be grateful even for the you know the unfortunate things that happen to you if you learn to reflect wisely yeah beautiful thank you it's quite moving to hear that your sincerity also in how you were practicing that way it's beautiful yeah. i will ask diana to unmute hi <coughs> I'm sorry, I can't open my video, but I'm here. Okay. You are there. I'm I can here. see your hand. <laughs> <laughs> my hand is up. <laughs> um, I'm noticing in this our little sutta excerpt the phrase, the liberation of mind by loving kindness right. and the liberation of mind by equanimity, which sounds like if you have that degree of all-encompassing total no holding back equanimity or loving kindness and I, I bet it does the other two as well in the full sutta um that in itself liberates the mind is that your understanding oh in this context my understanding is liberation of mind means uh, liberation from the five hindrances liberation from the five senses liberation in terms of samadhi because i think the word will be vimutti and that's usually or vimoka and they're usually terms that relate to the jhanas not to full liberation so normally the way they translate liberation or the word liberation when they use that word it's um it's not enlightenment mm -hmm. um it's liberation into the state into the jhana realms if you like that's how i understand it um but to go deeper with that i mean if samadhi is a prerequisite for seeing things as they truly are and you're practicing these brahma viharas and developing them so deeply that you do experience the jhana states free from hindrances then certainly you have more opportunity to see things as they really are and um I think personally from my own practice that adding loving kindness to whatever I'm aware of or even doing loving kindness as a practice in itself is for me anyway uh, most of the time more beneficial than even anapana actually mm -hmm. not always I mean I have had some quite profound experiences with breath meditation and when that has happened I've thought oh it's actually somehow purer even 
don't know, simpler maybe than the metta. But I think in the suttas, often the sequences that one first practices with uh, anapana and practices the four satipatthanas, and then later they start to generate the four Brahma Viharas in all directions. Maybe, that, maybe that's why. So easy because they have no hindrances at that time, so they can just exude it, you know, without trying. Yeah. Maybe instead of by, it should be with the liberation of mind with loving kindness. It's both, I think. I would say it's both because by loving kindness means you've practiced loving kindness to the point where you've liberated your mind from ill will and hostility, right? Right. You've made the mind big, exalted, vast, awesome. <laughs> somebody else said overflowing you know you've made your mind huge so you did that by loving kindness i think or through loving kindness right um, that's what i was thinking but so loving kindness liberated you from the five hindrances hmm. yeah. i think you could say by loving kindness but the beauty is you would be with loving kindness also because these if you're practicing the Brahma Viharas to get into deeper samadhi or uh, deeper samadhi arises as a result of practicing the Brahma Viharas, um, it will carry with it a certain quality, a certain flavor, you know, the flavor of loving kindness, the flavor of compassion. That will be more its characteristic than, than getting into these states with anapana. You'll have that extra element of loving kindness, more warmth. Yeah, I think. But I mean, it's hard to describe these things, and it may be different for different people. But uh, yeah, does that make sense, or am I? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's beautiful. Thanks. <laughs> So this one is an excerpt from, oh, the Iti Bhutaka. So, okay, never read, I never read that, actually, uh, because it's possibly a slightly later text, or at least some of the suttas in there are slightly later, possibly. Um, but I don't know if there are any sutta heads here who actually really know which ones are later and earlier. So this one is called Loving Kindness Shines Like the Moon. Monastics, whatever grounds there are for making merit productive of a future birth, these do not equal a 16th part of the liberation of mind by loving kindness. The liberation of mind by loving kindness surpasses them and shines forth bright and brilliant. Just as the radiance of all the stars does not equal a 16th part of the moon's radiance, but the moon's radiance surpasses them and shines forth, bright and brilliant. Even so, whatever grounds there are for making merit productive of a future birth, these do not equal a 16th part of the liberation of mind by loving kindness. The liberation of mind by loving kindness surpasses them and shines forth bright and brilliant. Just as in the last month of the rainy season in the autumn, when the sky is clear and free of clouds, the sun on ascending dispels the darkness of space and shines forth bright and brilliant. Even so, whatever grounds there are for making merit productive of a future birth, these do not equal a 16th part of the liberation of mind by loving kindness. The liberation of mind by loving kindness surpasses them and shines forth bright and brilliant. And just as in the night at the moment of dawn, the morning star shines forth bright and brilliant. Even so, whatever grounds there are for making merit productive of a future birth, these do not equal a 16th part of the liberation of mind by loving kindness. The liberation of mind by loving kindness surpasses them and shines forth bright and brilliant. Hmm. It's quite poetic, isn't it? Yeah. I think this ties in a little bit to another sort of 
I forget where it is actually, but it's in the main Pali Canon, not in the Atavutaka, um, where it says that giving donations, you know, even if you were to give sort of thousands of pots of food, it wouldn't be as powerful as even a moment of loving kindness. And that probably does mean, you know, quite deep loving kindness, I would imagine. Um, and I always wondered, you know, how is that the case? But I think it is because we're cutting off these defilements at the root level, like we're really overcoming ill will and hostility. And so if we work at the root level of the mind, purifying the mind at that depth, then we're more likely to perform. We will still perform acts of generosity, right? So-called making merit will keep you very generous, but it will be quite unconditional. And, uh, you know, true loving kindness, the way Darren was describing, you know, just giving without even thinking of anything, getting anything in return, never mind expecting, right? Without that thought ever coming to your mind. It's just so pure, so spontaneous, because if there's no ill will, I mean, there's no barrier at all. Right? I think this is quite a beautiful uh, little sutta, lots of nice similes there. And shining forth bright and brilliant. It's also like the mind in those jhana states, very bright and brilliant. Yeah. Hmm. Anything anyone would like to say on that? Shall I read the next one? So this one is the benefits of loving kindness. Maybe we can have some discussion around this. So these are the classic 11 benefits of loving kindness. Monastics or community, let's say, when the liberation of mind by loving kindness has been pursued, developed and cultivated, made a vehicle and basis, been carried out, consolidated, and properly undertaken, 11 benefits are to be expected. What 11? One sleeps well. One awakens happily. One does not have bad dreams. So it's quite interesting that the first three are around the quality of our sleep. That's the first benefit you can get, you know, because you're able to deeply relax and let go. I also think it's to do with not having remorse, you know, not going to bed at night with a guilty conscience or regrets, unfinished business. And I often teach on retreats, you know, that it's, it's quite a good practice to get into, a good habit to just, even before your head hits the pillow, but definitely when your head hits the pillow, to just do some moments of metta, of loving kindness, really you know, towards yourself, but also to others, just really wishing them well. And sometimes, of course, you're quite sleepy, so that might actually be your last thought before you sleep. And it really programs the mind in a beautiful way. One awakens happily. Well, if not, you do a bit more. <laughs> do it on awakening as well. And uh, one does not have bad dreams. That's interesting. I maybe don't have enough because if my life is a little bit insecure, I sometimes have dreams I sometimes have funny dreams where Ajahn Brahm's come over but I don't know he's here and then he's being I don't know he's going to some centers where only the monks can go these are my kind of nonsense nightmares and I'm excluded you know <laughs> or one time he like tried to climb through a roof and he went up 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 into the light you know and before that we were hanging around together having a nice time and he went up and I couldn't get up and I had three Dhamma sisters there trying to pull me up and they got my arms up, you know, my upper body, but I couldn't get through, I couldn't get through. So I told Ajahn the next day, because it was really, it really upset me actually. It was like, oh, I can't get there. <laughs> so I told him the next time I spoke to him and he said, you just use a ladder. You know, you're allowed there, you're allowed up there. <laughs> anyway, nuns nightmares. <laughs> Obviously, it's quite symbolic, right? Going to into the light, into Nibbana, maybe. <laughs> but anyway, they're my kind of bad dreams. So here it's saying we don't have bad dreams. And I guess, again, you know, you're sort of contented, right? Contented, quite at ease in life. 
you're healthy too, right? Loving kindness has health benefits. Um, Rob has his hand up. I wonder if you want to comment on, on any of this part so far. Yeah, it was actually, um, I was just reading back again on the four divine abodes, actually. Just one quickly, one quick thing about that. With regards to the word immeasurable, if you look when it says, um, when the liberation of mind by equanimity is developed in this way, no limiting action remains there. It also says no limiting karma remains there for loving kindness. So I assume what, what they're saying there is that there's no limiting, um, there's no limiting karma that's going to limit your goodness in, in a way. It's immeasurable because you're not limiting your goodness. Yeah, that's one way to interpret it. It's interesting. I think you're pointing out, right, that the vocabulary is different. They actually say something different for the equanimity. Is that right? They don't say karma, do they? No. They say limiting action, what the Buddha says. Okay, that's really interesting. No limiting action. I mean, often karma is translated anyway as action. Um, so it may be the same thing. But the way I understand that, and this was another sutta I was looking for to, um, to interpret this passage, is that the mind is so full, if you like, yeah, like you say, of goodness, like it's vast, it's abundant, it's exalted, that the hindrances can't come in. So at that moment, you can't create bad karma. And any bad karma that arises just dissipates because the power of that loving kindness overwhelms any kind of uh, residual effects of something you may have done in the past. And there's this lovely sort of called the lump of salt, which I've probably talked about many times in these groups, but it might be worth um, reading that a little bit because this talks about um, how karma is experienced differently depending on the state of your mind. And I mean, I know for myself that if, uh, you know, my mind is smaller, more brittle or more prickly, if you like, um, it can't contain so much it can't really um you know if i remember somebody that's irritated me i might again feel irritated whereas if my mind is big and vast and you know developed through loving kindness i'll be just oh they're really sweet you know they just didn't really mean anything they've got all these good qualities so if i even think of this person it's just absolutely nothing happens and if anything you just feel more meta <laughs> they just join in the party <laughs> and that's happened to me with the most difficult of people you know people have really harmed me in the past um, when the mind was big through loving kindness. So in that sense, it felt like the effects in a way, the vipaka, maybe not the kama, but the vipaka, the effects of that, um, what's happened, what went before, were very much weakened, very much diluted. So in this particular sutta, it compares um, two kinds of people. And the Buddha says, um, here, some person has created trifling bad kama and yet it leads them to hell, while some other person has created exactly the same trifling karma, not making trifles, just it means a little bit of karma. <laughs> yet it is to be experienced in this very life without even a slight residue being seen, much less an abundant residue. In other words, it doesn't impact them very much at all. And that's because precisely the mind has got so many good qualities it just really doesn't make much difference. Rather like if you have a garden and it's full of flowers and then there's a little weed that grows. I mean, no one even notices that weed. Whereas if you already have a garden full of weeds and Russian vines, like I have here, Russian vines, <laughs> then, uh, you know, after a while, it just takes over and you can't find the flowers anymore. <laughs> yeah. So every, Rus every Russian vine that grows, every shoot that it puts out just has a bigger, it gets you into more and more trouble. <laughs> Yeah, and so you're going in the wrong direction. So then he explains this with the lump of salt. He says, suppose somebody would drop a lump of salt into a small bowl of water. What do you think, community? Would that lump of salt make a small quantity of water in the bowl salty and undrinkable? Yes, Bante. For what reason? Because the water in the bowl is limited. Yeah, opposite of immeasurable, isn't it? Limitless. Thus, that lump of salt would make it salty and undrinkable. But suppose a person would drop a lump of salt into the river Ganges. 
What do you think? Would that lump of salt make the river Ganges become salty and undrinkable? No, Bente. For what reason? Because the river Ganges contains a large volume of water and thus that lump of salt would not make it salty and undrinkable. So this is how we can transcend, if you like, or dilute, if you like, our karma. It's not that we have to experience everything we ever did before exactly the way we did it. You know, it's not like you do one thing, you get one thing back. You do 10 things, you get 10 things back. It's, uh, it, it's different to that. It depends on the, the mind that the results arise in now. So if this is the reason that we focus on the three right motivations, because if you have a mind which has an attitude or a way of relating that is loving, that is warm, that is accepting, embracing, even when difficult stuff comes in, it actually doesn't impact the mind nearly so much as when you just leave the awareness bare or so to speak, or if you're distracted and even already agitated, it has a huge impact, right? But if we learn to like relate to things kindly in a peaceful, compassionate, loving way, then our mind is big enough to be able to hold even fairly severe grief or distress. So I don't know, I think that relates to what you're saying. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> But I find this a really fascinating aspect of, of meta practice. I do think it's a wisdom practice in that sense, because we start to see that the way we regard the world, others, ourselves, really does depend on our state of mind at the time. We really do create our world, you know, um, and depending on our mind, the world looks one way or another. It's not the world itself that has an inherent quality to it. It's not another person themselves that's inherently good or bad, agreeable or disagreeable. It's largely the way we create that in our mind. Yay, we can see Diana on video now. So you have to find another question. Hi. <laughs> so I'll go back to the 11 benefits. So we had one sleeps well, awakens happily and does not have bad dreams. So the first three. And then the next ones are more around how other beings relate to us. So this is interesting. It sort of suggests again, a certain aura that we may carry. One is pleasing to human beings. One is pleasing, and I'm going to say to devas. It says spirits, but I think it's devas. There are other types of spirits, um, but they're usually rather afraid. You might be able to please the ghosts, I don't know. And then the next one is deities protect one, and that's definitely devas. So you're protected by the devas, all these invisible beings. And actually, quite recently, Ajahn Brahm said, why don't I talk to them sometime and ask for some help? Because I'm absolutely no doubt they exist, although I've never seen one. Um, and it's not something I usually do, but actually, <laughs> should I tell that story, Kelly? <laughs> Because we were going into Stroud the other day. I didn't put this in the newsletter. <laughs> People think I've gone crazy. Uh, so instead I say it publicly on a recorded video. Okay, anyway. <laughs> so we were coming into Stroud, which is a place that I have a feeling for, for the property, for the monastery in the long run. And uh, I, I was already very happy because there were these beautiful trees sort of lining the roads and coming right over. So it's like green tunnels that we were driving through with this mist, morning mist, and sort of a sunlight just gradually making its way through the mist. And uh, everything looked quite magical. And I thought, oh, I bet the devas are around, you know? And then I thought, actually, I should tell them I'm coming, you know, like I'm a good nun. So I said, hi, devas, I'm quite a good nun. I keep my virtue, you know, maybe you'd like to join in this journey. We're going to look for a property and it's going to be a benefit to people. We only want to practice meditation. We want to do good things there. So give us, you know, you might want to come on the journey and give us a little hand. <laughs> so I kind of talked to them just like that, but I felt, you know, I'm sure they're there and uh we got into town and tried to find some parking and just parked in a kind of average you know it's just an ugly little car car park it's nothing special just because it's in Stroud so then we parked there and uh came out of the car park and the first person we saw like within a minute or two minutes um was this man who basically asked us like oh so where are you coming from like I said, oh Oxford you know yeah but what tradition and so I said well Theravada and you know tried to figure out how much he knows but he, he knew so then we got into this conversation about um 
me coming with uh, coming there to look for whether or not it's a potential option for a monastery. And he said, oh, I that would be so wonderful. There are meditators here and it would be a real hob, you know, it would really bring people together. And he used to go to Amaravati. I don't know that he stopped going intentionally, but he obviously now lives a fair distance away. And uh, he said, my house is just here, just come in for a cup of tea. So we had a cup of tea and got to know about his family and even his daughter. Her middle name was Chanda, but Chandra. So the Sanskrit version. But anyway, my name. <laughs> and he knew people in the town that could help us if we ever wanted to organize a retreat. And I haven't heard from him yet, but I've got his contacts. And he said, next time we come, if there's no parking, we can park at his house and just come by any time. So it was really incredible because that just doesn't happen that people stop me and say, it'd be great if you came to start a monastery in this town, you know? This doesn't happen, this has never happened. So whether that was the Davis or whatever other good karma might be behind me, I don't know, but uh, it became quite an interesting day. <laughs> yeah, so. Somebody's asked, shouldn't we say Devi? I'm not sure. I think Deva, Devi, yeah, maybe. Uh, Deva might be male, but I think it might be gender neutral. I'm not sure. Devi, maybe? Maybe it should be Devi. Okay, Devi then. Devi and Deva. There we go. But I say Diva. Because hopefully they're not Divas. <laughs> okay. So, all right, yes. So one is pleasing to human beings, pleasing to spirits, and Davies and Davas protect one. Isn't that nice? So you have to have, I don't know, not too much loving kindness. I'm sure if they protect me, they protect all of you for sure. But the, the idea is also not to do that often. You know, this is really important because otherwise, and also be very careful about your motivation, because if you want to ask them for all sorts of worldly things, that's not really what they're there for. You know, they like to get on board with beautiful things, Dhamma projects, things that create happiness in this world. They're very good beings on the whole. Of course, there's Mara that's further up in that Deva realm, and he became the kind of control chief, <laughs> control freak in chief of the uh, Deva realms. <laughs> so they want to kind of control, they want to keep you in this world. They want to keep you in this world. So when you look like you want to get towards Janus, the, the Mara who doesn't like that, and they try and say, I'm not ready for this. This is too much bliss. Oh, what's happening next? I should know. I should be involved. And that's Mara, right? Trying to keep you in this world. Because if you move out of this, then they won't be able to control you anymore. They won't know where you've gone. So anyway, whether you believe these things or not, but I think it's important to actually um, sometimes talk about them. It is very much part of the Buddhist uh, tradition. It's written about in the suttas. And I know some secular Buddhism has been criticized for being rather racist because they do remove anything that looks like it may come from Indian cultural um, understanding. And often it's just the Dhamma, right? So I think it's good to teach it all in full and we don't have to decide whether there are such beings or not. But sometimes you feel it, right? I remember doing a meta retreat in uh, Italy. And this also was after this quite traumatic experience with somebody else. And um, I was practicing a lot of metta, like intensively for two weeks. I mean, it's basically only practicing metta and it's the first time I'd done that. So it was really going well. And uh, at some point I just felt so kind of settled in myself. So um, not grounded, but just really, really well, really, really at ease. And I just knew in my heart that if that person would have tried to get to me and attack me, they wouldn't have had a chance. It's like there was a sort of force field. I, I, my whole energy was different. And I don't know if that's the Davis or it's the practice of Metta, but it is almost like there's a force field around you. Like it's very hard to harm, say, an Ajahn Brahm. How could you harm? You can tease them. It's quite fun to do that. <laughs> but, you, <laughs> but you could never harm such gentle beings, you know? And the Davis know that too. Anyway. I'll stop talking about Davis unless there are any questions from anyone else because it might not be that much of interest. Yes, please do leave early if you need to, anybody. It's perfectly fine. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Lovely to see you. So the next benefits, fire, poison and weapons do not injure one. 
that's a force field, isn't it? Fire, poison and weapons do not injure one. Or is it something more practical? Is it more that you're not associating with the kind of people that might use poison and weapons? You're not going to the places where people might be, you know, using poison, alcohol. <laughs> poison, alcohol is poisonous, right? You're not going to, yeah, you're not associating with bad friends, right? You're staying at home doing your meta practice instead of going down the street late at night. <laughs> But it's interesting, it could be both. I always do think there's an element of practicality here for sure. And, uh, you know, our behavior also determines the kind of experiences that we draw to us. There's a really lovely talk about metta by Ajahn Brahm. It's one of my favorites that he gave to the monks probably in 2001 or so. And he makes a sort of analogy at the end, you know, the fire of ill will, the poison of, I don't know what he calls that one greed maybe and the weapons of hate or something and they're the real fires poisons and weapons huh? that can harm us our own ill will our own hostility our own anger our own delusion so that's the most dangerous one and then number eight is very important one's mind quickly becomes stilled <laughs> here it says concentrated so it becomes like that sort of superpower washing up liquid where it's concentrated and it's just, you know, really all, a lot of stuff in one small cubic, what do you call it, fluid ounce. <laughs> That's concentrated, right? But I think the mind of loving kindness is expansive. It's concentrated in the sense you're only on one thing, you're only consumed or suffused in one thing. But the mind is actually uh, vast. So it's probably maybe the English word concentrated that's a little bit off. But yes, it means one's mind quickly and sometimes it says easily attains samadhi. And again, that's because it's countering these hindrances of ill will. And ill will is the strongest, I think. Obviously related to greed, but, you know, we have ill will towards what we can't get, isn't it? So ill will is very... Oh, gosh, it's nearly half past eight. Oh, okay. So ill will is very poisonous. So the last two or three. One's facial complexion is serene. That's nice. I can see lots of serene people here. <laughs> We've all got a lot of loving kindness. One dies unconfused. So again... That's related more to, yes, to having good qualities, but also to having clarity. Hmm? You're dying unconfused. So your mind is clear. You understand the wholesome and the unwholesome. You understand what's to your benefit or to your detriment. You're unconfused perhaps about the Dhamma. Maybe you've gone beyond the practice of the Brahma Viharas and actually attained to stream entry. And then the last one, if one does not penetrate further, so perhaps the last one did, one fares on to the Brahma world. So you're bound to get a good rebirth, in other words, a happy rebirth, a place that you can dwell in a lot of loving kindness and be around all kinds of other beings who practice a lot of loving kindness. So it's a very happy existence. When the liberation of mind by loving kindness has been repeatedly pursued, developed and cultivated, made a vehicle and basis, carried out, consolidated, and properly undertaken, these 11 benefits are to be expected. So there we go. We should be getting some of these, not all of them, not all the time. But if you're genuinely, generally moving towards some of these, and you can start seeing some of these in your life, nobody here has been shot recently, hopefully. <laughs> Or, uh, yeah, taking too much, I don't know what is poisonous. Then we're doing pretty well. And it's great to have these guidelines because it shows us quite easily whether we're on the right track. It's a bit like the uh, beautiful advice that the Buddha gave to Upali, the barber, Venerable Upali, that if it's the Dhamma, we know it's the Dhamma. If it leads to peace, if it leads to fading away, if it leads to Nibbana. 
there were more in there too, but now I'm too tired to recollect the whole verse. So we have to know which way this is leading. And wonderful benefits, very worldly benefits in a sense, but I think, you know, the quality of one's sleep can really affect the quality of one's life or waking hours as well. So try the loving kindness practice every evening and every morning, and I think you'll find significant change. It really is just a mental training. You know, the way you incline your mind. And as the Buddha said, whatever you frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes your inclination, becomes your character, your way of being in this world. So let's keep practicing until ill will barely ever arises. And if it arises, it's quickly overcome. <laughs> it doesn't stay as long. Great. So it is half past. So I'm going to invite uh, Gunther, I think, to say a couple of quick words. Yeah, thank, thank you. Today's session is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. Any contribution you're able to make is very gratefully received and will help support Venerable Chandra's physical needs, the day-to-day -day running in our current residence in Oxford and soon Wiltshire, and the development of England's first monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. Thank you for your ongoing support. Thank you, Gunther. Thank you to the, all the co-hosts and to everyone here. Um, I think there are still some opportunities to offer food also during the my rains in Wiltshire, like we have a roster uh, where people put their name down and because we're going to get fairly big shops, not every week, maybe every couple of weeks, um, it'll be a bigger amount of food. So we thought if we can have two people on each, we can split the... Uh... Anyway, there's a system there. So if you write to team at anukampraproject.org, they will help you with that. They'll assist you. And it's always just an invitation to, you know, to you to practice generosity to whatever capacity you can. Nothing is expected. That's part of loving kindness. Everything is gratefully received. And any amount, any amount, even a penny is never too much. <laughs> I mean, never too little, right? Never too little? That's right. Never too little. <laughs> but you can have too much. And it's not good to have too much. I think there should be a maximum wage or a maximum level of um, comfort in a monastery, let's say. So... And yes, I wanted to remind you that tomorrow we do have a meta, um, meditation. So because the following week, which would be the second or the fourth Saturday, I'm not available. So I'm doing it this month, tomorrow and on the third sun Saturday. OK. So the same as the Sunday sessions. And because this is the last month I'll be teaching for you for quite a while. Um, but we will have some other groups on Sundays for you as well. Hopefully you're all on the newsletter. So you may have been, you may have received the dates. Otherwise it will be on our website pretty soon. So I do hope the community continues to gather and I will be here for a couple more weeks. So take care everyone. Thank you so much for everything and for being part of this lovely community. Brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> take care. And let's unmute you.